We are lucky enough to have Mr. Clive Clark on for a second time. Uh, we loved him so much the first time that we had to get more of his story. So everybody sit back and enjoy podcast number two with Clive Clark. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Travel Royally podcast. We're, we're literally thrilled to have back with us for a second visit, visit Clive Clark of Clive Clark Design. Welcome, Clive. We're thrilled to have you back. Well, that's great. It's lovely to be back. And uh, here you are sitting over on the other side of America, and I'm sitting on the California side, and uh, there's uh, Dunbarney Links in the background in Scotland. Exactly. Well, that's a great segue. Let's let's talk more about uh, Dunbarney. And one of the things I haven't heard, Clark, is where did the name Dunbarney come from? Well, that was the uh, name of the original piece of land, Dunbarney Links. Okay. And in Britain, very often the golf course is called after the town or the village or the piece of land. I think less so in America. Uh, you know, it's like uh, names like Raging Falls and yeah, yeah, Coppertone Beach. Uh, you, you know, these sort of names come up. Um, whereas England is probably just more conservative in the sense they just generally call the course after the piece of land. Right. Excellent. Now, you know, the last time we were together, we, we talked about how the project came about, the vision that you had, the people that you and your friends that got involved, including uh, Malcolm Campbell. Um, so how long did it take to go through the environmental process? I know that everywhere in the world, it seems to take a lot of time to get through that, that process when building a golf course particularly. Well, the, the process is fairly rigorous and uh, we actually employed 24 consultants, including lawyers and accountants, because you're dealing with both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and you have ecologists and archaeologists and people who follow the traits of badgers. And yeah. uh, it's quite a team at the end of the day. But I, I guess we, we had 24 because we couldn't manage with 23 consultants. It would be <laughs> like a hole in the net, so to speak. And then you, you uh, they put all their reports together and then you submit to the council, in, in this case, the five council who were very helpful and they wanted the project. They thought it was great for employment and you know general prestige of that particular area. Um, and then they have about four months to mill through all the information. And then you, we actually had a 12 nil unanimous vote by the council to go forward, which was terrific. But then you have to uh, satisfy about 40 odd conditions, uh, which takes a little time. That's, that's another two. So it's about a year and a quarter, probably. And then once you had that approval, how long did it take to actually construct the course? We started uh, in 2018 on May the 29th. And we had the whole thing constructed and seeded by uh, the end of November. So we started wow. in like early autumn, seeding, everything's in irrigation. Uh, we worked with Landscapes Unlimited, we our contractor, and Bill Kubley, who I know well because we're members of the same golf club over here. And Bill's team did a terrific job and the weather was kind to us. We had a very nice warm summer yeah. and it, it moved very quickly. We had three shapers on there following the big dirt movers and it, it just all worked like clockwork. Uh, that's, that's in Scotland, a short time to get the whole thing together. May the 28th and you're, you're done and seeded by the end of November. Was that six months to construct the course? Is that, that seems like a really quick time. Is that how long you normally take to build a golf course? Well, in the desert, I've done it in that time because you're working in the summer when it's warm and there's no rain and you're on sand. Yeah. Um, so the courses I've done here in the desert, which uh, would be four courses, uh, have all come on at that sort of pace. Now, the course I did in Maine, we were in a forest with wall-to-wall -wall boulders the size of a small car. And 
they, there's only one way you deal with boulders. You pick them up one at a time. And wow. that, that took about two and a half years. Wow. That's crazy. Though. So it varies. Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 I've heard that there may never be another Lynx course constructed in Scotland that between the, the lack of available land and then environmental groups that protest. I know there's one planned up in uh, above um, Dornock called Cool Links that's yeah. that may may or may not ever be built, but well, that's a shame because I, yeah. I think that's probably going to be a would be a very good project. It had Mike Kaiser behind it, who did all the abandoned dunes. Um, it had Crenshaw, um, Cause and Crenshaw as designers, who are very good designers. And they, they, I think they got through initially through the local council and then there was all sorts of appeals from various ecologist groups and it went back to a government and, it, it, you know, it, it, it's unfortunate because uh, it, a piece of land where really nothing is happening, it's vacant and, you know, a couple of people walk their dogs, which is great. But the joy it gives to so many people to play a round of golf in a beautiful setting and look out at the ocean and the sea and, you know, the dunes. It, Lynx is a kind of world apart because generally there are no houses on Lynx. Right. So, right. These, like, you, you, you know, you're walking through nature. It, 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 it's such a wonderful and, and you're following a hobby that you enjoy and the local people all get employment. Uh, plus, plus the caddies, you know, you probably th these sort of projects carry a staff of about four or 50 people, which is all employment. But then there's the plumber and the electrician who comes in to do stuff, and the restaurants gain because people are coming to the area, and the hotels gain. You know, it's really a win win situation. So, uh, I, you know, I, I feel badly for uh, Cool Links because they've done really, as far as I can see, everything right. But, yeah. There's opposition. Yeah. Yeah. The economic impact of having a course, uh, particularly in that part of Scotland, where young people are leaving because there aren't job opportunities, mm. right? It's, it could be a wonderful economic benefit. Yeah. But on Dunbarney, what, what are your hopes for Dunbarney in the future? I'm, you've already held the 2021 Women's Scottish Open. What, what other hopes do you have for Dunbarney? I just hope that people come back and <laughs> play it again, because that's exactly what they're doing, because yeah. there's a lot of options. It's a thinking man's golf course. And when you've had one round, I mean, it's advisable to take a caddy because they know the course, they've been trained. Uh, they, they understand how it plays and where to go and what the options are. So that, that's a good thing to do when you come to Dunbarney. But you know, if you pull your trolley or carry your bag, that's, that's, that's fine too. But people that I spoke to it, when I was over in Scotland last year, which is nearly all Scottish people because with COVID, there right. wasn't very much outside travel as, as you would certainly know being in the business. But um, they, a, a lot of people I talked to would come back and some of them had played it five, six, seven times. So yeah. they were just sort of intrigued with the options and what I would do next time. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's funny, you know, I, I, what's surprising to me, I've talked to, it seems like I've talked to a lot of people in Scotland in various professions around the golf industry, professionals, greenskeepers, club secretaries, people like that. Um, and I'll, I'll, we'll talk about St. Andrews. And you would not believe how many people that live in Scotland haven't played St. Andrews. It's staggering, right? I mean, it's including professionals, right? They haven't played it for whatever reason. <clears throat> Kenny, Kenny Palace, our friend that does, owns the Lynx Diary, he's never played it, as an example. Yeah, now he's got a good excuse. He's waiting to play it with his father. But the reason I bring that up is that every one of those people, I say, well, you get down to St. Andrews and almost invariably they say, yeah, I, was down, I played Dunbarney, right? Or, and you're, you're like, you played Dunbarney, but you haven't played the old course. 
you know, there, I, I don't know. Uh, I certainly see the attraction to Dumbarney, but you would think that arguably the most famous course in the world, many Scots haven't played it. Have you had that a similar experience Met people that haven't played it? Uh, to be honest, I haven't really asked yeah. them that I, you know, you would, you would think as the home of golf and particularly being in Scotland and with Scottish people around, they would um, absolutely want to go there. I mean, why, why wouldn't you? I mean, right. it's, I, I, I love the old course. It's, because it's it you know it's just not like other golf courses. It's kind of cranky and different, and the bounces and where bunkers are, and some of them are hidden. It's an experience, really, probably like no other. Um, right. But I find it very enjoyable because it is so different, and it asks you questions, and it's unconventional. I mean, particularly on the front line. Very often you just see the top half of the pin. You don't actually see the green. Right. And you've got to figure all this out. And then where do I go? And should I take a safe line down the left and go on another fairway? Because there's half a fife over there to aim at. Or do I risk getting a better line? That That's the strategy, you see, because particularly when they used to keep the greens very firm, if they put the pins on the left behind the bunkers, you had to go down the right side to get a, to get a decent shot. If you played very safe and went way left, you were kind of closed off and you had a much more difficult second shot. But if you went down the right, then you had to risk the gorse all the way down the right going out. So it's a strategic course. It, it's the most fun course to play. And you probably have to play it a few times to kind of get the feel of it. Sometimes somebody just plays it once and they don't get it the first time. Yeah. And then they, every time you play it, you love it more. It's just yeah. that sort of great golf course. That's been my experience, and I've played it probably 10 or 12 times, but the, the thing is, um, I know for you as a professional, when you were playing tournaments here, that you would go down the right or, or because you would get a better angle in. For amateurs like me, the motto is left is right and right is shite. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, Clive, for an amateur playing there, you can go left on every hole except nine, 10, and 12. And as you said, no. half a fife awaits you on the left. Um, you, can go, you can go as far left as you want almost on those 15 holes and not be worried. Yeah, I played, uh, I think I was 18 the first time I entered the Open as an amateur, and that was uh, 64, 1964. So I'm showing my age a bit here. <laughs> but, uh, I played on the Eden course um, to qualify, and I shot a couple of 70s and got into the Open, uh, which was the year Tony Lima won, Champagne Tony, who yeah. was very famous in those days, unfortunately, had a crash in an aircraft and didn't make it uh, about three years later. Um, but that was really exciting to see and play the old course. Um, yeah. the, the atmosphere is really like no other. and. Um, those of your guests who played it teeing up on the first hole, then you're right by the Royal and Ancient Clubhouse and the big bay window of the big room, and you feel all the eyes appearing down on you. And on top of that, you look up and the golf gods there, 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 riveting their eyes on you. <laughs> I mean, for a lot of people, that's a daunting experience. It, yeah. it kind of feels like teeing off the first at Augusta National in the Masters. You know, that's. That's quite an experience when they're 10 deep around the tee and stretch all the way down the first fairway. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to get nervous, it, it's probably going to be one of those two occasions. Right, exactly. Now, you know, you, you obviously have a love for St. Andrews that we hadn't talked about. Um, but I know that you love Lynx Golf. So let's talk about St. Andrews just for a moment in terms of, hmm. did anything about St. Andrews, your experience going back to 1964, influenced the way that you thought about designing Dumbarney? Was there anything about that that, because you talked about St. Andrews um, makes you uh, answer certain questions, right? It, hmm. Yeah. Well, I've had the experience because we lived in Britain uh, and a lot of the uh, golf courses where one played, for instance, the British Amateur Championship was always on a Lynx 
golf course. The Open Championship is always on a Lynx golf course. Uh, PGA tournaments were invariably on a Lynx. So, so I was very familiar with playing Lynx golf, which you don't really see very much in the States. If, if you're talking about genuine Lynx, I doubt there's more than seven or eight, perhaps. Right. When Malcolm Campbell uh, co-authored a book called True Lynx, and I think they found four or five in America that they would consider under their fairly strict uh, conditions to be genuine links. So I think that in many respects is why a lot of American golfers go over to Scotland because Scotland has more links golf courses than any other country in the world. Right. And uh, the, the assessment in this book was that there were 240 45 genuine links throughout the world out of I'm not totally sure how many golf courses there are in the world now but when that book was written there were about 34,000 and only 240 were genuine links in right. the author's opinion so um, there's something special about links and of course it's the oldest form of golf the old course is over 600 years old yeah yeah quite an age <laughs> well, hopefully Dunbarney will uh, be around 600 years from now. It'd be nice to have people. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm still playing it as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, when you play Dunbarney, what's your favorite hole as a player? I, I'd like to say all of them, but uh, putting modesty aside for a moment, the short eighth, I think, is a cracking little hole. It's... It, you're, you're slightly elevated tee. It's not very long. Even off the championship tee, it's only 163 yards. But as you move forward, you're probably playing a shot of about 140 from the regular tees. Um, and you've got this wonderful backdrop behind you. You see over the course and then right over the first and fourth. You, you, on a clear day, you can see as far as Muirfield, North Berwick, Edinburgh. Um, and the green is a little bit smaller than most because it is a short hole. And there's a very slight, if, if you hit it just, say, a couple of feet inside the uh, right edge of the green, it will tend to just kick a little bit of right and then you're down a slope. And depending whether we got semi-rough or not, um, it can trickle into a nasty little burn down there. <laughs> so, the shot really is the left half of the green, regardless of where the pin is. It's only a short shot, but make sure you get on the green. And now you've got a chance of a two or could make an easy three and yeah. move on. That, that hole causes for a very short hole, I suppose rather like 12 at Augusta. That is not a very long hole for the pros, so, you know, hitting nine hands, but it right. causes a lot of trouble. And this is, it looks very innocent and straightforward and very pretty with the backdrop and Earth of Force stretching out and on a clear day, there's all the reflections and it all looks great, but it's a little tricky. Yeah. So it's, it's, one to, it's one to watch out for. Yeah, I like that hole, but I, and I feel the same way you do. I, it, if someone's asked me what my favorite hole is at Dunbarney, I'm, I'd be really hard pressed. I love 17 and 18. Uh, you know, I think they're all great holes, but oh, now you. you've, got, you've got an enormous property there. Do you have plans to build a second course there? Uh, we do have an option with the owner to uh, build a second. You know, well, look at it. We don't know what COVID is doing at the moment. We haven't yet had a full season to look at, but we, we do have a lot of uh, overseas bookings this year, which is terrific. And the Scottish were very over the first two years, which was virtually our only customers, they were over 90% of our uh, play for the first yeah. opening up. So, so, you know, well, well, go cautiously, but look at the possibilities. And if we're getting very full, I, I think we could have a course. It's, it's not a dissimilar piece of land. Um, and one would give it a slightly different links treatment, perhaps. But yes, it, 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 it's a possibility anyway. Would that be on the land that lies north of the present course? Or it seems like there's land up there. I didn't, I don't, I'm not as familiar with south of there. No, it would be uh, east. It would abut. Right, right. But it, 
along the water as I face the water, is it left or right? You're left. Left. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. So while we're on the topic of your uh, design business, um, we talked a little bit last time about Lake Winnipesaukee, and I, uh, you, you offered to uh, give me a hundred dollars if I could spell it. I tested myself twice and couldn't do it, so <laughs> your, your uh, hundred dollars is safe. It took, it took me a year to learn how to spell it. I mean, it's it's a tricky one. It doesn't. It's a bit like just down the road from where we are at Dumbarney. Uh, there's a most beautiful old world village, which often wins village of the year in Scotland. It's charming. And it's, it's called Kanoka. Or some of the Scots pronounce it Kilconka, which is the way it's phonetically spelt. And I mean, there's, it's quite yeah. a difference, isn't it, between the two ways of pronouncing the same village but it's 10 minutes down the road and uh, it's very charming well earlier well last week i interviewed a, a person for the uh, podcast and he's the uh president of a club in scotland or excuse me in ireland and it's it's spelled c-r-u-i-t like cruet and i knew that it was called crutch so i called it crutch island and he corrected me it's Cruich, right? Oh. I'm like, got it. I mean, there's no way you could look at that and get Cruich out of Cruit. But anyway, Lake Winnipesaukee, I, um, I took a tour of Lake Winnipesaukee aerially. You've got, there's a, a wonderful, you can do a hole by hole yes. tour by air and it was, it's wonderful. It's got a lot of great accolades, but it led me to think about um, the the golf course architects that that we're all familiar with, and and what their signature hole is or a, a stylistic feature that they have. And I know last time we talked that you you look at things very visually. You're more you're very artistic about how you go about designing a course. But as an example, you know, Jack Nicholas when he designs a course has a lot of left to right dog legs because that's the shape of his typical shot. Corin Crenshaw or minimalists, and they've got gentle slopes. And Pete Dye likes water around the green. Other people don't want water around the green. Donald Ross likes small greens and great bunkers. Do you have a signature move, so to speak, that people would recognize? You know what? I'm a chameleon. I like that. Uh, you, won't let, you'll, you'll, you can go to one course I designed, and you'll see a certain. Uh, strategy or look and you can go to another one and it, it may be totally different because the land is different what it accepts uh, I would like to think of myself as an artistic designer which probably comes from the fact that I went to art college and I also went to study to be an architect to do buildings so I can draw my own plans um, but I like, uh, and one of my hobbies is photography. So I like holes to frame. If you pick up your camera and you frame it up, it, it yeah. frames yeah. the picture. Um, so that's probably the reasons why I lean to being artistic. Right. Um, I'm sort of technical as well, but you have a team of people to be technical. Uh, Clive doesn't do the irrigation design because Clive is not an irrigation guy. Right. I know we need it. I, I, I know a bit about it, but you have an expert do it, that side of things. Um, there's nothing wrong with leaning on experts if you get anywhere, whatever you're doing, you know, whether you're a right. person, it, 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 it's good to have a, a team that you can work with, but I do all the drawings myself, which I like because then I can keep control of what my eyes tell me. Yeah. And what fits the site. Yeah. And also what fits the client's budget is another matter that <laughs> comes into play. Well, yes, I think uh, well, uh, we'll have 84 waterfalls on this course. That, that'll be perfect. <laughs> well, that doesn't suit everybody's pocket. Exactly. Why would you have 80 waterfalls anyway? <laughs> well, true, but in this case, you had to satisfy your own pocketbook, right? You were paying for it. 
you and your partners. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You well, know, hey, the links. What's that? You're not, you're not bringing in the landscape, you see. Right. In general. So Dumbani has no trees and typically links. Generally, there are one or two that do, but generally they're, they're not tree lined. Right. There aren't trees. Yeah. It, it, it's dunes and burns and movement of the land. And it's a different sort of game. So, you know, if you don't, I mean, the desert, for instance, here, we, yeah, it's full of landscape. It's it, and, and all the water features, they're a major part. Whereas yeah. links, they don't have big lakes and landscapes. So, so there's quite a saving there to building a links as opposed to a, a different type of golf course. Well, I, when you, you're right about the trees, there's, there are a few trees at Carnoustie. Yeah. Um, Hillside has some trees in Northwest England, Formby. That may not be considered a true links, but um, I'm trying to well, think. Well, the story goes, there used to be ABC always broadcast in the old days for years, the Open Championship, and they sent somebody over to inspect a specialist so that the, the camera on top of the TV tower could pan this way and pan that way. And there were no trees or anything in in his way yeah. and he did this for several years and came to the open and made sure of course there weren't any trees to miss but he went right. over there on the trip every year and yeah probably executive accountants came over and they suddenly realized there are no trees so they get hold of this character and say look you've been over here the last 10 years on our expense account but there are no trees to which he replied See what a great job I did. <laughs> That's wonderful. Tacky dog story, but could be true. Don't know. Yep. Well, let's move on to your playing career because I think that's one of the things that fascinated me about, about your background um, as a course designer, having played at such a high level. And so not long after you um, were on the... Walker Cup team in 1965. Not long after that, you turned professional. Mm -hmm. And earlier, you talked about being how people are nervous at St. Andrews. How nervous were you at the first uh, professional event that you played on the European tour? Were you nervous? I think you'll always be slightly key teeing up on the first tee in, in a tournament or championship. And you even ask Tiger, and he'll tell you the same sort of thing. So I think that's commonality between uh, amateurs playing top level golf, professionals. Um, yeah, I, I was actually lucky because the first round of golf I played as a professional, I had to qualify on whatever it was, the Monday or the Tuesday, for our British PGA Championship. And I shot 67, which was the course record. So I was off to a good start. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't play so well in the first round of the tournament, but I was a kind of you know, one of the first amateurs to turn pro. And here he is, Clark Clark, shoot 67. And about 300 people came out to watch me on the first round. And I shot 39. And there were marshals. There were about 10 marshals with big bamboo sticks keeping the gallery back, you see. And then I went down... 10 and I looked backwards halfway down 10 and there were uh, four marshals and two dogs watching me <laughs> down the back line. <laughs> the golf's a great leveler, it goes up and down. And so I missed the cut and I didn't play very well the next week and I missed the cut again. And then I got a check in the Jays Fluid Tournament in Ireland of all things. So I can't remember where I finished, about 25th or something. In, you know, it, was, it wasn't very much money in those days. And then the next week I went to Denmark and I won the Danish Open. In your so, fourth event. Yeah. So it's a funny old game, you see. You can yeah. go from shooting the course record to missing the cut to getting a very modest check to winning the following week. Um, it, it's, it's, there are rules to the game, but there are no rules as to how one will play on any given day. Right. Ever you are. What do you remember? Or do you? I think many of us do. Those of us that are amateurs, we remember our best round, the best I ever played. 
do you have a memory of playing, you know, where you're in that zone where it feels like you can't miss and you're, where did you play your best round or have, have your best round to go? Well, I was, Ryder Cup gave you three exemptions to the American tour. So I used to come over to the West Coast initially and play in the LA Open. And I knew Bob Toski and Bob was kind enough to spend 15 minutes on the practice ground with me. And I thought, oh, that's terrific. Thank you, Bob. Where are you playing next? Or I'm going over to play in Florida in the Citrus Open. He said, well, I live over there. He said, come and see me and I'll spend a morning with you. Fantastic, because Bob Tosky, Tosky was one of the recognized top teachers right. of the day. So I did that, and then I flew back to, Stock, uh, to Sunningdale, back in England, my home club. And the first round of golf I played the next day, I shot 62. So he did something right <laughs> for me. Uh, no, it's very helpful. And then in tournaments, I, I guess um, I shot 64 in the last round of the French Open. And I was tied, and I unfortunately lost the playoff on the first hole. Which was, you know, it's a hole you'd just give me a par. It was a very long, difficult uphill par four, and uh, my my par wasn't good enough as it happened. But you know, these things, as in four playoffs, and I won two and lost two. Yeah. Well, I know you're also proud of the round that you played, the final round of the '67 Open, where you played so well um after the 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 difficult start that you had i think you you went on to shoot even par after starting yeah. you know four over after three or whatever yeah um I, I was just having a magic week that week i played two practice rounds for gary player and i played great i shot 67 66 i was you know right on four and this pretty much continued through the first three rounds, and I was lying fourth after three rounds. Jacobus was lying third, so we played together in the last round. And I started horribly, six, five, five. So you've thrown four shots out the door. And I continued to play horribly for the round. I chipped and putted nearly every green. Uh, and with the uh, five holes to play, I decided my problem was I was getting into his rhythm because he hit the ball so hard. He was the longest player on the tour at that time. Right. And I, I said, you've got to stop watching this. So I looked the other way when he hit and told myself to slow down. And I finished with three birdies in the last five to shoot a 72 on a breezy day with a horrible start. So. Yeah, that, that was probably not the lowest round I ever shot, but probably one of the most significant rounds right. I shot. So I, I moved up to uh, tie with Harry for third place and Jack for second. And lovely man, Roberto de Vicenzo, what a charming man. I mean, he was one of the nicest pros you'd ever meet. And incidentally, a magnificent strike of the golf ball. Yeah. Yeah, well, he unfortunately signed a wrong scorecard at the Masters, and yeah, but which leads me to um, you were able to play in the Masters in 1968. You famously had a hole in one on 16 there with a two iron, and um, what what was it like playing the Masters for the first time? I think it's way more difficult than you anticipate. I played in the Walker Cup, but. Baltimore Five Farms is not exactly like Augusta National. Right. Neither are the Greens. Right. And I guess preparation, you know, it, I arrived, I can't remember, but probably two or three days before the first round. And um, stranger Gary Player was around and we played together in practice, which is lovely because, I mean, you're playing with one of the top three players in the world, which yeah. is always good. And he, he's a terrific guy, Gary. Um, and socially, and by, the, by the way, by the time you would have played with him, he'd won the Masters once or twice by then, correct? Oh, I think he'd won everything, probably nearly by his yeah. <laughs> I think he won nine majors, didn't he? I, I might be wrong, but I think it was nine. Unbelievable player. Uh, what a short game, too. I mean, it, 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 amazing bunker play, chipping, putting. Um, 
you know, because we all know he wasn't a tall man. He, he made himself strong through exercise and right. was probably one of the few players in those days who did a lot of exercise in order to get strong enough and keep up. Um, here's the thing about playing Augusta National, particularly in the Master, you play a couple of practice rounds and we all know the greens are very slopey and very quick. So the practice round, the pin's over here or it's over there. When you come to play it, pins obviously are in totally different positions. But you have to, I mean, they're difficult to read and the pace is very difficult to get because they're very quick. I mean, you take a putt, say the pin on 16, the par three, <clears throat> which has that shelf high on the right. Well, we've all watched the Masters and seen the pin down in the sort of, uh, like the basin on the left. And to get there, you have to put 90 degrees away from the hole. Well, unless you practice that putt, you've no clue what to do. How on earth do I do this? And in fact, with the greens at that pace, you, you, you can't stop the ball short of the hole. Once you're up on that shelf, you're probably going to go five or six feet past at best. Right. So the greens, I remember, because I did a bit of commentating for four years for CBS and Frank Chikinian, who was then the producer, but I remember one day, and they put me on the 16th hole, and there was an old veteran, Doug Ford, and he had a, the pin was on that back right yep. shelf where I hold in one. Yeah. And he is uh, two feet to the right of the hole. So he's putting downhill a little, and then there's that ramp down to the bottom of the green. He missed the two footer. He had, he had a 35 footer coming back. Uh, you know, it's it's tricky. And the other the other thing too, I think about playing, you you have to be a little bit conservative. And if you know you get a few over par or something, you come to holes like 13 and 15, the two par fives. And in those days they were two good woods. You were having to, oh, for me in most of the field, except the, the Nicholas's and people, but uh, a drive and a three wood over water is not an easy shot for right. anybody unless you hit absolutely pure you know just miss it slightly or misdirect it slightly and you go splash and you can quickly get a seven on your card right and so knowing augusta very few people have ever won it first time round because there's, you, you just need to know it yeah and I, I didn't play particularly well I didn't play well that week but the week after i went to the q school in Florida, eight rounds of golf to get your PGA ticket. Yeah. And I finished fifth out of 100 and, about 130 or 40 players, which was great, played well. And I was on the plane on the way back from there to play in the next tournament in Britain on the tour, which was the Ag for Giga. And I was flying back, sitting next to a, a, a journalist who I know very well, Mark Wilson, who used to write for the Daily Express. And over dinner, we had a conversation and he said to me, you know, you're going to win the Ag for Giva. I said, really? Well, how, do you, how do you work that out? You know, I'm a bit tired. I've just played eight rounds of golf, yeah. sweat away to get my card. He said, well, he said, it's quite simple. You're two shots better than anybody else in the field. I said, really? How, how do you work that out? He said, because you're the only player in the field this coming week who has an American tour card. And I kept it quietly to myself. And I walked on to the first tee. I didn't say anything to anybody. I said, well, he says, I'm two shots better around than the people I'm playing with. Of course, I wasn't. Right. But I happened to shoot whatever it was, a couple of 67s. And I was leading by two or three shots at halfway stage and uh, continued to play pretty well and won the tournament by two shots. Now, I'm not sure if Mark Wilson, bless him, had not said that to me on the plane. It just gave me inner attitude and confidence and golf is a game of confidence. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've got it. Um, it's interesting about that. It seems like your those two wins that you've just described. And of course there goes the train by my, my, my office. Um, are just amazing that they happen. You know, you win the Danish open in your fourth start. Mark Wilson says, hey, you're two shots better than the field. Um, and after playing eight rounds of qualifying school, holy cow, 
I want to come back to that, but I want to go back to the Masters for a minute. Who was your playing companion? Um, do you remember who you played with the Thursday and Friday? I do. I do. Um, no, it was a great week. So I had practice rounds with Gary Player. You can't, you can't do much better than that. Right. And I played with Dave Marr the first round, who many people, I mean, he was a great player in his day and he won the PGA Championship. But uh, he was then. Uh, nearly into TV and he was an analyst in TV and did a very good job and was an absolutely charming person. And after he finished with ABC, he came over and worked with us in BBC. Um, you couldn't be, you couldn't meet a nicer guy and unfortunately yeah. he died rather young. Um, and uh, Jackie Burke, who eventually became the Ryder Cup captain for the American team at uh, Muirfield. And he's a Masters winner yeah. as well. Yeah, absolutely. He just turned 100. I'm going to say, I think he's still alive. He oh, is. He, um, do you know she hit a horizontal at the top, can he? Well, I don't know. I don't just know kidding. about that. But do you know Sheena Willoughby? She owns the, or she used to own the Dunvegan, right? right I know of her. I, 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 I haven't met her, but I know of. Okay. She's a friend of mine. And she and her husband, Jack, have a place at the Champions in Houston. Mm. that's his club so she's Correct. friends with him and she'll post pictures of him and you know celebrating his 100th birth it was either his 99th or 100th i think it was his 100th birthday but um that's amazing and bill and um dave marr is um everyone loved dave marr i mean yep. now he something happened at 68 him. masters other than your hole in one uh, between Thursday and Friday, you had a, a six-shot improvement. What did you learn about the course overnight that allowed you to shoot such a good score on Friday? Well, I think I learned that going at those greens, the par fives, if you could just reach in two with a three wood was probably not the best idea because if you came unglued, you came unglued in a big way. Right. Um, so I think it's a course you've got to be patient on. And it, it, you know, it's good to attack a course, but you've got to choose where you attack it and where there's a possibility of taking a big number, you, you should keep the big number out because let's say on those power fives, you can lay up to a nice length or some people might leave themselves a 50 yard pitch but a 50 yard pitch isn't always the easiest shot sometimes you're better with like a full sand down of whatever it be 100 right. yards uh, and 15 at augusta it, 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 if you lay up you're on a down slope and perfect as the golf course is you're on a down slope and the grass can lie a bit tight because it's early in the year it's usually in around the second week of April. So the grass hasn't had a huge amount of time to establish. So if you've got a tightish lie on a hanging, it's tight and hanging, and you've got the pin on the front. And as we've all seen many times, you can, you can with a short shot, you, put, you can pitch, pitch the ball five or six yards onto the green. It takes the spin, comes back, and you're in the water. Right. And you're not very happy when you've got a sand down in your hand and you end up in the water. That's right, not right. good. So it, there's, there's a lot to Augusta and the strategy and knowledge of the course helps a lot. And the general feel. I mean, in Britain in those days, you didn't turn up and they were 10 deep around the first tee and right down the fairways. I mean, that's that's a sort of, oh, hang on, quite a lot of people watching this. My old friend Bobby Cole used to say, who won the British Amateur and qualified at 18 to play there, he said he looked down, he teed it up, and he was bending down to get all he could see were feet. All these feet around the tee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, he, oh, Bobby Cole, he was a long hitter. Yeah. And he, he played with Sam Sneed in the first round. And Sneed hit a good drive, he hit a good drive. And he's 25 yards past Sneed. And Sneed looks at him and says, I won't mention a make, but he says, son, these doggum golf balls don't go no place. <laughs> he's 25 yards back. That's funny. Um, 
Well, I want to shift. You also had the opportunity to play not only in the Masters and 10 British Opens or Open Championships, as, as you say over there. Um, you also, the, the Ryder Cup, you were able to play in 1973. And today, the Ryder Cup is a first-class affair, but I've heard Tony Jacklin say that prior to the 1980s that um, the Euros didn't have the same resources as, as the U.S. When you played, was it, what was it like playing in that, because you played at Muirfield that year, what was it like playing in that, in that Ryder Cup? Well, I'd love to have had a bit more experience at Ryder Cup, but when I turned pro, you couldn't accept Ryder Cup points for five years. Now, the first year of 67, I was third in the money list, so I'd have got loads of points. Uh, as the French say, zero point, no points. <laughs> and then the next one, uh, I'd won two tournaments in the Ryder Cup space. So I assume I would have probably got in the team that year. And so it took a little while to get in. Um, I mean, it, it, it's quite a tricky thing to play in, 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 in the sense of pressure. Uh, we, were, we were, as you say, at Muirfield in Scotland, so we didn't have the travel thing. And when Jacqueline became captain, he upgraded it. He didn't want his players flying in the back. He wanted them on Concord or at the front of the plane. Right. So things got, you know, I think um, morally, so to speak, to the play. Oh, yeah, we're sitting in the front or we're on Concord, you know. Yeah sitting in the back, you're, you're suddenly representing your country, but it, it could make you feel like, well, all the Americans, you know, they fly on Concord, why can't yeah. we? Yeah. It's just psychological play. But anyway, Jacqueline did a great job to change all that around. Um, yeah, the experience of playing in a Ryder Cup is terrific. And there's no escape, actually. Once you're on the stage, it's not like, you play poorly in a tournament, you just, you're just with 140 other players and you miss the cut or whatever. You're not happy about it, but there's no spotlight. Ryder Cup, you know, you're playing with four matches out there, whatever, and you're in the spotlight. And yeah. you just have to perform. It's very, very exciting. I mean, it's a wonderful event. I mean, it's one of the great events in sport. Oh, I agree. I agree. I, I went to the, uh, the Ryder Cup at Valhalla I'm guessing that was 15 years ago or so. And that was the year Boo Weekly was one of the Americans. He was quite a character back then. But uh, yes. <laughs> And that was Azinger's team, where he, where, he, where he put the people into pods and, yeah. and had, had great success. But, you know, you played for a captain, Bernard Hunt, and he's not as well known in the, in the States as he is in Europe and certainly in the in, – Great Britain, but he was a wonderful player. He had, I think, well, I know he had over 30 worldwide wins. Um, he played very well in the Open Championship. Like you, he had a T3. I think that was his best finish. How was he as a captain? Was he a, was he a fun to play for, so to speak? Oh, he's, a, he, he's a really good guy. Unfortunately, not with us anymore. But uh, I used to play when I was on the tour in Europe. I used to play a lot of practice rounds with Bernard and Neil Coles uh, and Peter Butler. And I would say Bernard Hunt is a very solid citizen, if you know what I mean. He wouldn't be, say, as flamboyant as Joe Carr, who was the captain when I played Walker, but just, yeah, intelligent, bright, made good decisions, um, and everybody liked him. He, he was just a genuine good guy who was a great player. I think he might have played in six to eight Ryder Cups. He could play. He was a tall man, about six foot two, I would think. And he had quite a short rhythmical swing and he hit the ball very straight. He was just, just a very solid year in, year out player. He was always somewhere near the top of the pile at the end of the year. No, good guy. Yeah. Um, what's your, well, okay. So you played with Eddie Pollins from, um, Ireland. Mm -hmm. What was it like playing against Nicholas and Waxkopf in the Friday afternoon four ball? Well, you may well laugh because 
I was always programmed to play with Peter Butler, who probably not many people would know in the States, but again, he's a very good player. He probably played in six or seven Ryder Cups. He's about 10 years older than me. And we always played in the four ball tournament together. And as I say, we had a lot of practice rounds as well when I was playing the turf or whatever it was, nine, 10 years. Uh, so because we, we'd won the four ball, we'd been runner up, we'd been third in the four ball yep. tournament, we were an obvious partnership. Unfortunately, Bernard Gallagher had oysters the night before. He would have been playing with Brian Barnes and our captain changed teams. So I had Eddie Polland, who was a rather wild Irishman who I'd never played golf with before. But as you say, it wasn't important. We'd only, we'd only got Weisskopf and Nicholas to play against. <laughs> <laughs> so we got on the first tee and, and, and I make a bit of it, if I'm speaking at dinner or something, you tell the story. And, uh, so we get on the first tee and they, they, first of all, read out the American, the American uh, team you're playing at. They read out their record. So you can imagine Tom Weisskopf, current Open champion, uh, runner up in the Masters four times, da 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 he goes well. Then Nicholas, well, I think we're nearly there half an hour while they read out what Nicholas had done. And as I say, if I'm making a speech, and then then they come to Clive Clark and Eddie Polland. And, uh, Clive Clark, who tied the 87th place once in the South African Pepsi <laughs> Corner Tournament, and Eddie Polland, who made a cut last year. So not strictly true. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it actually gets worse because so then it's they have driven off and the, there's a the fairway where the dog leg occurs at about 250 or, or so. they went through that gap like a couple of jet planes. It was their honor. So now we've got to follow this with all the announcements and things. And so eventually it's the representing Great Britain and Ireland on the tee, Clive Clark. Eddie grabbed me by the arm and pulled me back. He said in his Irish voice, I can't wait any longer. Then he rushed on the tee, gave it a hit and hit it straight over the out of bounds wall on the left. <laughs> and now I'm left there out of turn. I managed to make a par on the first, which was quite good after all that. But uh, Weisskopf hold a putt and we were one down. And uh, Eddie came back from the dead and made a birdie on the second, but so did Weisskopf. I made a birdie on the third, so did Nicholas. But we played our hearts out. I, I had, uh, we got beaten three and two, and I had par in for 70, which, which you know, in a Ryder Cup is, on that course, four 70s would come close to winning an Open. Right, right. And it was rough, was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> you could lose players in there. <laughs> so anyway, it, it was quite, quite an experience, and, uh, you yeah, know, it's a nice, nice thing to have done. What's your favorite memory of your Ryder Cup experience? Getting off the golf course. No, 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 I joke. <laughs> just, just the, I think the enthusiasm of the gallery. Yeah. A lot of people come to watch and they're very excited about the Ryder Cup as they are today. It, it, even then it, it created huge interest. Now it's mega interest around the world. It's yeah. Wonderful. It's a great event. Right. Yeah, it, it, it truly is amazing. I think my two favorite sporting events, you know, and I, it, okay, so here in the States, you're familiar with the Super Bowl and the Rose Bowl and the World Series, and I've been to um, all of those, but what stands out to me is um, an open championship at St. Andrews is... But anywhere, I, I've been to five Open Championships, and you're, they're, they're all amazing. But St. Andrews is extra special. Mm -hmm. And the Ryder Cup that I went to at Valhalla was, it's just amazing. The, the, as you said, the gallery, the reaction to, to the play is just amazing. Now, you, said, you mentioned something earlier that I hadn't thought of. I, you qualified uh, to play in the U.S. Did you, um, did you play? Um, a season or two here in the U.S.? No, I came over. Uh, I've been playing well because the, the previous year I was third in the money list in Europe. And I started to play and I was lucky enough that I got some reputation. So I occasionally, and I was with IMG, 
uh, Mark McCormick uh, got an invitation, which was great. It saved the agony of Monday morning qualifying. Yeah. But I played, you had to play in 15 tournaments in order to keep your card. And I think my game was very tuned to playing in the wind in Britain on Lynx courses or otherwise. But in those days, there was, in Britain, there was no irrigation on the fairway. Uh, they just used to irrigate the greens and the tees. So the ball ran and I played a kind of running game. I hit the ball low and run. Uh, certain courses or types suit certain players. Like you'll notice that Trevino rarely played in Masters because Augusta is a through the air game. and Lee hit the ball fairly low and relied on shaping it, etc. cetera. Um, so I, I played in about six events. And, you know, you miss the cut. Now you've got to wait till the following week. And where do you go? And what do you do? And you know, as capable in Europe and the rest of the world, if I played well, I would be in contention. And I decided if you stay here too long doing this, so I was over there maybe eight, nine weeks, and I thought, you know, this is not doing my confidence and golf game any good and maybe my golf game isn't really geared and I had to change my golf game a bit to try and fly the ball further through the air because it was more a game of carry the fairways were soft yeah. because they had irrigation we didn't in Britain yeah. so I think I made a very good decision I thanked the commissioner very much um I can't remember whether it was Dean or before Dean Beeman but uh but I've decided I'm going back to play the worldwide tour rather than America, but you've all been great. Thanks, you know, thanks yeah. a bunch for including me. So well, and I think I, my friend Peter Townsend, who was a very good player the year before, he'd won a lot of stuff. He stayed there seven years, just batting his head out against the odds. Well, and I think today, I think today, if you had that opportunity, you know, if you were a 25 year old or 24 year old, yeah. they had the opportunity to play here, for the types, the type of money they're playing for today, you might have figured out a way to hit a, play the ball through the air, right? I mean, the money they're playing for today is oh yes, sure, it's great. Amazing. So no, let's move good decision to yeah that come out recognize your limitations and what suits you. And I mean, you can take an example like Peter Thompson, great Australian player who won five. British or Open Championships, yeah, open, you right. call it. Um, he rarely, he was one of the best players in the world, but he rarely played in America for whatever reason. Right. And then when he got to 53, the tour, the senior tour started and he came over here. He's a very bright guy. Uh, and he did very well. And he came in August, he came back to Britain. And he, came around to our place for dinner one night. And I said, uh, so August, Peter, you're going back now to play some more tournaments? No, 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 he said, I'm going back to Australia. I said, why would you go back to Australia when you're playing so well? He said, well, he said, I've won eight tournaments this year. He said, I'm so far ahead in the money list. Nobody can catch me. So I'm going home to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, funny. Yeah. You know, one thing we haven't talked about on your playing career, I, um, did you play any senior events or were you wrapped up in broadcasting at the time? No, I changed at the, a bit prematurely perhaps because I was still playing quite well, but uh, I was the tour pro, the playing pro at Sunningdale and they, Arthur Lees was the club pro there. He was a very good player. He played in three Ryder Cups. And he was retiring the following year at the age of 70 and the club invited me to take over, but they said, you're still playing well. If you want to play 14 tournaments a year, that's good with us. So that, that, that was, you know, a new thing to do. I've been playing in the tour for 10 years and I knew everybody at the club. So, and it's a great club, Sunningdale Golf Club. Yeah. It's a premier golf club in Great Britain. So I did that. And then the, <laughs> the first, the end of the first summer, BBC, I had an audition and they seemed to like me and asked me to come and do their tournament. So very difficult to be head pro, playing 14 tournaments a year, work for BBC and keep everybody happy. You can't. So yeah. I, I, I plumped. You see, the good thing about TV, which a lot of people appreciate, 
as opposed to playing on the tour. When you work in TV, you know you're going to be there on Sunday afternoon. You don't well, necessarily know that when you're a player. Yeah, it's a steady paycheck. Yeah, and it's a nice thing to be involved with. And as with right. Peter Allen, who's a great guy and a lot of fun to be around. I've known Peter for donkey's years. And uh, I'm sad he's no longer around. In fact, we're uh, going to his uh, celebration of life um, in, uh, during the Open Championship this yeah. year at St Andrews. Uh, well, you were, he was, um, so how did you come to, I want to come back to him because he's, he's one of my favorites too, but um, how did you get the invitation to, uh, from the BBC? How did they, what led them to think you would make a, uh, a good commentator? Actually, Peter introduced me, <laughs> the, the, the Colgate as it was then, ladies, professional championship was on at Sunningdale where all the top LPGA players from America played. And I walked into the office one morning, eight o'clock, and there was a message on the desk, would you like to go and have an audition with the BBC? So I thought, well, that'd be interesting. It's not really something I want to do. And sort of, I don't, yeah. I wasn't someone who liked public speaking, shall we say, particularly, I do it, but, and that's kind of like public speaking. You're on live. But I thought, oh, I'll just go up and have an audition. Why not? And had the audition. And it was early morning starters. So there was nobody that you'd know anything about. So I just talked about the golf course because I knew the golf course like the back of my hand. Right. And half an hour up there and came down and I thought, oh, that was fun. You know, I'm sure it'll be a don't call us, well call, you know, one of those. Yeah. And uh, a few days' time, the phone rang. And the producer from BBC said, we'd like you to come up to Glen Eagles to work with Peter Alice and Henry Longhurst. And I felt shivers go down my spine. So I'd never done it before. And you're just thrown on live on the air. And the only thing they tell you, they say, who's... Right, we're going to such and such a match. Yeah, uh, Q Clive. And you've got to say what hole you're on who the players are and what the score is. That's the sort of stat, and that, that's all you get told, you see. So I, I, I started, so we're on the 14th green and it's so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so is two under par. And I get him, I oh, no, 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 he's three over. So I've only, I've only said one sentence and I'm wrong already, live <laughs> on TV. Now, now where do you go? <laughs> Nobody tells you. <laughs> so uh, no, that, that was... Uh, I worked uh, 18 years and didn't miss one live event in 18 years with BBC. That's fantastic. Now, were, were you an on the course commentator in the booth? Uh, both. The first three years I was in the uh, booth and then, uh, then producer, 18 years. I went through four producers in 18 years. Um, he'd gone over to America and he'd heard Rosberg on the golf course and he liked that idea. And he came back and said, Clive, would you be prepared? Because we can't put uh, Peter on the golf course, obviously. And uh, Henry Cotton was working with us and he was about 79 in the shade then. So he obviously couldn't go on the golf course. Clive, you're the only one. And you know all the players, of course, because you've played professionally. Right. So, so I said, fine. So I ended up uh, being on the golf course, like Rosberg. And then, you know, when players came in, I'd do the interview. You know, Henry Cotton designed some golf courses as well. He designed um, the second course at my club up in Scotland at Murray. We've got an old course that old Tom Morris designed and a new course that Henry Cotton designed. So I, I, did, I, did he do any others? I, I don't know of him as a golf course designer. He did Panina. He may have been involved. He said he went down and lived there. Panina in Portugal. I think yeah. he may have had something or did design it. I mean, he was obviously from a different era, and he's one of the three professionals who've been knighted by the Queen. Posthumously, he was united, right. knighted, um, as was Bob Charles, and um, who was the other one? Oh, Faldo. Nick. Oh, wow. Sir Nick. Sir Nick. Sir Nick. Now, you brought up your, the fact that you went through four producers in the BBC. 
Mm. When you came to the U.S. and worked um, the Masters for four years, Frank Trukinian was the producer. He's yeah. got a heck of a reputation. What was it like working for him? Fantastic. <laughs> the, language, the language could get a little blue from the control room, all in jest, but you've got to realize it's jest. He doesn't really mean it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he yeah. was he yeah, was recognized as being great yeah, at what he yeah, did, right? The whole story, but it was, we're coming to sixteen with you, you limey. Don't screw it up. Now, it sounds like it's a brutal statement, and everybody's laughing. You see, that was that was a team of people who uh, worked together. You know, ben Brown, Pat Sumrall, all the guys, Weisskopf, uh, Vern Lundquist, uh, and they were great great team but you used to do your rehearsal you see in the butler cabin to do your hole so when you stood up in your cbs blazer and you're at the back of 15 or 16 or whatever and they play it in you're actually in the butler cabin on a green screen so it looks like you're sort yeah. of there um and oh steve melnick who was very bald by this stage, he was a very good player when the US amateur and various things as a pro. So he'd stand up and the guys would have a practice session, let's say, you see, so you sort of go through your lines, here I am, Steve Miller from the 10th hole, which is a, you know, long, difficult part of whatever you'd say. And the technicians, they'd put love grass they'd imposed on his hair on the top of his head you see so we're all killing ourselves laughing yeah. because he can't see the picture so he and this is just in rehearsal and stuff yeah. but they they had a lot of fun we had a lot of fun he, he was great he was known uh, affectionately as the ayatollah because he kind of ruled the roost he was a very a-type personality yeah and a lot of fun that team to work with then well you know it's funny what's funny clive you what you mentioned people and uh I've got such a uh, a wealth of useless golf information or knowledge. <laughs> Steve Melnick was uh, a very good golfer, obviously. He played golf at the University of Florida. They won the national championship. Mm -hmm. I think Hubert Green may have been on that team. But additionally, wow. there's a gentleman named um, Wendell Coffey who lives here in my community and owns a little par three nine hole course and driving range um, that I like to go to. And he he's, he's probably in his mid seventies. Now he's still giving lessons there, but if I could, if I got, had a dollar for every useless piece of uh, golf information I had in my empty head, it'd be, it'd be nice. Now. So you were in the booth for the first three years. And I think Henry Longhurst was with you for those first two years. Correct. Didn't you worked with him for two years? Yes, yes, I, his last two years, because he wasn't that well, and eventually he didn't make it. Um, great, great commentator, very different from Pete. Peter, Peter Alice could light up the sky with his commentary. I mean, he had the voice, uh, not the Henry, Henry had a voice different to Peter's, but uh, I guess, you know, Peter could talk about a Rick or a little kitty when it cut to a little kitty with a lollipop, and he always had bam. He had he had the humorous comment. He, he, he I think I, to me he was the greatest golf commentator I've ever heard, and there have been many good ones like right. Johnny Miller and many more. Uh, but I loved listening to Peter, and I was privileged to work for eighteen years with him. Uh, Henry Longhurst, on the other hand, he he too could walk into the production caravan and. You just remember, well, well, it's been another wet day here. And uh, I noticed the clubhouse was getting a bit wet. And those bricks, he'd say, on the, and he'd talk about a brick for 10 minutes and he'd make it sound so interesting. Yeah. Um, but he was, he was kind of known as a drinker. He loved loads of booze. And his nickname in the press wasn't, uh, his name was Longhurst, but their nickname was Long Thirst. And he, Henry came up to Glen Eagles one time, and strangely, because you know, I think he was educated at Cambridge, um, but he drove up 
from Sussex, which is quite a long way. It's probably right. a 450 mile drive. And I think he stopped for a particularly good lunch in Edinburgh on the way up and a particularly good lunch included a lot of booze. And of course he was probably half smashed when he had to drive from Edinburgh to Glen Eagles and the police stopped him on the way because he was like weaving across the countryside. And <laughs> the policeman sort of poked his head into Henry's car and immediately said, before he breathalyzed or anything, you're drunk, because the fumes just hit him. Yeah. To which, to which Longhurst replied, thank goodness for that. I thought the steering had gone. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, he got let off. I mean, everybody knew who Henry Longhurst was. Well, be careful, sir. It just drive nicely to take it easy. Well, I'll tell you the story that I like. <laughs> yeah. What happened today? I'll tell you the story I like to recount, and I've told uh, a number of my friends, was a story, well, they, they listened to it on the podcast, the story you told about him when he saw you with your new tie, and at a, I guess you guys were at a cocktail party, and he oh, said, right, yeah. is that your school tie or your very own? Your very no, own is that your own old school tie or just your own unfortunate choice? <laughs> he had a way with words, you know. But he didn't often, when, when he died, in Wooldridge, who was a great sports writer, wrote the obituary in the Daily Mail. And he started the obituary along the lines, um, Henry had brilliant, he's talking about his TV career. Henry had brilliant flashes of silence. And it was Henry, he would let the picture talk. When I, he was commentating when I had the hole in one at Augusta. And all he said, I've seen the tape. Now, well, here we have, so that was, well, here we have uh, young Clive Clark on the 16th tee. I dare say this will be a long iron today. Said nothing, and, you know, practice swing, hit the ball, and it pitches on the green and rolls up the bank on the right, and the pins on that back right shelf, which is tiny, and it rolls up. Crops in the hole, and the gallery on the left, the patrons as they're called, go crazy. They're all standing and cheering and waving their arms, a heck of a noise, and eventually it dies down to almost a silence. And all Longhurst said was, hmm, and there you have it. And that was it. Economy of words. Exactly. That's it. He exactly. let the pitch and talk. Yeah. Why use 50 words when you can say it in four? Right. Um, well, you, you were very fortunate to get to know him um, as you mm. did, and, P and Peter Alice as well. And as you said, um, you think he's the best. And I, I, I don't disagree. I loved listening to him and Ben Wright um, yeah. broadcast. They were, um, they were wonderful. And, 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 and more recently, the way that I come, came to know uh, Renton Laidlaw was through, he was still covering... Uh, even his later years, the yeah. European tour. Very good, very good athlete and a wonderful guy too. Terrific. Yeah. Uh, well, I've got two more questions. Peter, incidentally, oh. Peter Alice, uh, uh, advised your viewers, look well, on um, Google or whatever you use, Peter Alice, when he got inducted into the Hall of Fame. And typical Peter, I've been, I did many company corporate days with Peter. And I say walking into dinner, what are you going to talk about? Oh, I don't know yet. I'll, I'll think over the main course. He could just talk and be totally amusing. Never a script, never notes. And if you go and look for Peter Alice being inducted into the Hall of Fame, which is 2012, the year 2012, do have a look. At Peter and his 15 minute speech. No notes, but hilarious. And if you ever had him a dinner party, Peter, sometimes there were tears rolling down your cheeks with laughter. He was just a very witty, very funny guy. Yeah, I saw that. And I love the ending where he flips off his oh, yes. <laughs> counselor. That was. Uh... It's Marples or whatever her name was. <laughs> yeah. She said, yeah, because she had told his parents, I fear for your son's future. Uh, yes. Uh, that's, a, that's how he spoke, though, all the time. You know, next week, he'd be doing a corporate day and a totally different speech. 
yeah. just off the top of his head. It was extraordinary. Yeah, he's great. He had that wonderful voice as well. The, the, the way he presented was fantastic. It's like top comedians, they have timing. Yeah, yeah, like absolutely. Tennis players, you watch Federer play tennis. He's got all the time in the world to get to the ball. Bob Hope telling a joke. That there's loads of air and time around it. It's a special gift. Yeah, I agree. Well, I've got two more questions for you. You know, particularly for, I, I spend a lot of time, um, I get up early in the morning and particularly on a weekend, I'll, I'll turn on the golf channel. I'll watch a European tour event. And I've seen um, tournaments all over Europe. Well, all over the world because the DP world tour now is everywhere, but you traveled all over Europe covering the tour. Um, what's your favorite course to travel to when you were with the BBC and commentate from, did you have a favorite? Well, actually, BBC didn't go outside of Britain, or rarely. We, I once got sent over to the Lancom tournament in Paris just to put on, you know, like an anchorman, which wasn't the job that I did. I, I was in the commentary box, or later on, I was on the golf course with the roving mic. And that's, that's a different sort of skill. In other words, you've got to get the program on the air, so... Here we are at saint lambre in Paris, and we've had wonderful weather through the week, and we've got a great field, that, or whatever you say. But that's quite difficult to do the first time. It's, it's, right. it's a different skill. Um, so anyway, I went over there, and I, I, I did that. But I thought I watched one or two anchor people, and what they'd done was right there, notes their own cue notes because there's no um, order cue and stick them onto the bottom edge of the camera lens you see yeah so i thought that is the way because otherwise you'll stand up and you'll forget in the middle what you're trying to do so anyway we go we go down to the golf course and this is the producer and i going into that camera up there it's in the middle of a lake up a hoist I'm doing it from 60 yards out. Bit of pressure. Anyway, um, as Henry Longhurst used to say, oh, well, never mind, it'll all come right in the end. Well, you know, it's funny that you say that. When I, um, like today, um, you know, obviously I wrote out questions that I wanted to ask you, and I've got them folded up and they're sitting on my keyboard. I uh, Hopefully no one can see that I... I've referred to notes, but I do have some notes in front of me. Um, right, right. Yeah, well, you don't need notes. I'm asking you the questions. I'm the one that needs to remember all the important things I want to ask you. But, oh, my goodness. Well, well the thing is, you know, when you're doing that, and I did the live interviews for BBC for quite a number of years, so the match finishes and I go into the mic and into and. I remember one of the ones was Seve when he beat Sandy Lyle on the 37th hole of the final of the world match play at Wentworth. And I said, in you go, Clive, you've, you've got a couple of minutes. Well, Seve always gave fairly short answers. And suddenly we'd be going two minutes, we'd be going three minutes, and the producer said, no, keep it going now, Clive, we've got loads of time. I'm running out of questions. Because you get short answers, they just right. chew them up. Right. And that's pressure when you're running out of questions. Oh my goodness, we'll be asking what he had for breakfast next thing. But anyway, we got through it. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you know, he died far too young as well. And uh, oh, terrible. What a, I mean, what a joy to watch he was to watch for from a, an amateur spectator to see him. Um, when, as he did the Opens and the Masters, he was, you know, it, when they say he could get up and down from a car park, he literally got up and down from a <laughs> car park. amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I heard David Faraday, who I know you're friends with, he hit, uh, he was talking about how he was in a tournament and he saw Seve in a bunker. Instead of hitting a sand iron, he took a four iron and drilled it into the face of the bunker 
it popped straight up and dropped to four inches. Like who would think that, you know, mm. you and I wouldn't do that in a practice round, let alone in an event, you know? It was a genius. Yeah. That's simple. It was a genius. Yeah. Yeah, it um, gave a lot of people a lot of pleasure. Yeah. As, would, as did Arnie. Yeah. As did Tiger. Uh, you know, and many other top players. It's uh, just one of those great sports that's fascinating to watch and equally fascinating to play. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, I played last weekend. <laughs> and I'd taken off a two months as a hiatus because I was playing so poorly. And my, my index right now is 8.1. Okay. Um, so I play, I'm one under after five, right? So things are looking up. Excellent. So I finished the front in 44, right? Um, I shot an 85 with one bogey and one birdie. Oh. I either had pars, doubles, or triples. Yeah. And there was, it was inexplicable, Clive. You know, you're literally inexplicable. There, were, there was one hole I remember where I made some bad decisions. Okay, I took a double. But the rest is just, you know, it, it's literally inexplicable. It's maddening. That's a curse of being an eight is I could shoot 74 or 85, you know, which is, which is something that's interesting. This will be my last question. You know, when you, when you talk about having a tremendous run of form, right. Where it could last weeks, right. For me, a tremendous run of form will run five holes or one round. I mean, it's hard for an amateur to put together two good rounds. You know what I mean? Like back to, if you're playing on a Saturday and Sunday, the odds of you, the odds of me shooting 75, 75 are very slim, right? So how do you get into that zone as a player where you can play two weeks straight with, within, that, within that zone? Well, I think, you know, for club golfers, they've got to realize that all these pros pretty much started golf when they were very young and many club players start, you know, they might be 40 or 25 or 50, right. whatever. And these guys are practicing all the time. So when I was a teenager in the school holidays, for instance, I played three rounds of golf every day, day after day after day after day. I practiced in between because it didn't take long to play golf in those days. And right. golf courses were 6,200 yards and you just whipped around them quickly and then have a lunch, have your balls, play with the next group, have a tea, play with the next group, take your putter home, practice on the carpet for an hour. Uh, and that's how you get better, that and to play and hopefully you get to play with one or two good players as I did as a kiddie, 13, 14. There were three good players off about one handicap at the club and they were very kind and they used to take me out to play. And you start to copy, oh, it's got a nice rhythm. I think I can manage to do that. And that's kind of a way you learn. And I was lucky that Sid Wilson, who was the pro at Scarborough North Cliff, was very simple in his teaching when I went there. You know, he sort of you rip out and told you, oh, you looked up a bit quicker. One. Kept it simple. Um, you know, some of the teachings, I think, get a little bit too technical and you know, if you know how to play golf, it's one thing. So if it becomes very technical, my argument would be, well, you're a tour player to someone. You're a tour player. And someone's telling you to change this and change that and getting it at the top. Then you swing down, you do that with the left hip and whatever it is. It gets very complicated. But you know how to play. You know the theory of the game. Well, I tell you what I would like to see. You know how to play. You're a tournament winner. Now go and play left-handed. You know how to play. You can do it. Yeah. Go out there. And they'll probably shoot 90-odd left-handed. They know how to do it. Yeah. But physically, it's 
different. Right. Well, I guess I'm cursed to be a uh, eight handicap for life and it's very good. I, Not many people are. I think what uh, what I need to work on and what most of us that are in that in the same the, those people that are in the same boat as me is to become a more consistent golfer, make better decisions um, and really fundamentally understand what your strengths are. And I think you know, you, Tony Jackson, Tony Jackson used to always talk about tempo in a golf swing. And he had a very successful career and won both sides of the Atlantic and the US Open and the Open Championship at Lytham. And when you think about tempo swing, it's tempo can vary from day to day. And, and that's a big thing. If your tempo varies, it, it makes it harder to be consistent. And tempo is, it's from, if you've got a jerky swing from the start, your tempo isn't going to be right. So if you can move the club back in a nice rhythmical swing and give it a little time at the top and don't rush it down, because if you rush it down, you're going to throw the club, come over the top and you're not going to get any solid contact or likely no direction either. So right. tempo, just keep in tone. He always just used to work on tempo. He didn't do things technically and he happened to have a very natural good swing anyway. So I, I don't know, I think tempo is a big thing. And if you get anxious, your tempo tends to get quicker, be nervous. Right. So well, when I'm, to... when I'm playing my best, I'm thinking of tempo. And the two guys that I think of are Freddie Couples and Ernie Els. Yes. Their Perfect swings look example. effortless. Pardon me? Perfect examples, both of them. Yeah, yeah. I certainly don't think of Nick Price. No, no, it was a quick swinger, but a very good player. Oh, yeah, course, amazing. You know, the amount of practice they're putting in, they can learn to play with a swing. The average golfer doesn't put in those hours of practice day after day, week after week, year after year. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's a fairly easy thing to think about, keeping it nice and smooth and rhythmical. And I'll tell you what happens. If you get quick from the top and you throw you know, over the top, you you lost the momentum in the swing. If you swing down a little slower, you can load the club and then release it. If you hook up from the top, it doesn't work. You just come over the shot and hit it with your right shoulder and it doesn't have the, you, you're in the wrong place at impact. Yeah, yeah. Well, Clive, you've been uh, very gracious with your time again. I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. The, uh, the response last time was, Phenomenal. Everyone loved uh, your podcast. I can't wait to hear their response to this one. And um, we're looking forward to seeing you in, in Dumbarney in July. Excellent. Looking forward to that too. I can, I can see from the screen behind you, it looks as if there isn't a breath of wind. Perfect day to be there, right? <laughs> Little breeze just creates a challenge. What can I tell you? Well, I'm sure so we'll have nice to you I again, Jeff. And, uh, Look forward to seeing you in the summer. We'll have a great time, I'm sure. Thank you again to Mr. Clive Clark. It is uh, amazing how much uh, history Clive has with the game of golf. Uh, we really enjoy having him on. Uh, we want to thank him again for coming on for a second podcast. Please like and share the video, and we'll see you next week.